what we have going on here. If you look at the end of the chapter review, they talk about some of the big messages. So we're talking about three types of claims, frequency, association, and causal claims, and how to interrogate or how to be somewhat critical of those claims. So this is a little bit of a vocabulary thing. So these seven terms are ones that you should be sure you've taken a look at in the book. And down here at the bottom, this is the first time that you see in this chapter a whole bunch of terms. And the nice thing about the electronic version is you can click and you can refer back to them. But when I said in the first lecture, make yourself some flashcards or make yourself you know, a record where you put the term and a definition that you've extracted from the book, this is where that's starting to come into play. And the reason that chapter three is an important one is it these themes get built on in the later chapters. Any questions on that? As I look at this chapter, to be honest, if I were writing this chapter, I would write it a little bit differently. But what I wanted to say is there are three things to look at here, that there are constructs or conceptual variables, like for example, school achievement or academic aptitude or positive reasoning. And these are at the level of just the language that we wish to use when we're talking about the study we want to look at. And then there are operational definitions. Operational definitions are the particular instantiations of what we're looking at. So if I want to, the, the book, for example, says, I'm going to look at academic achievement and the oper an operational definition might be, for example, a person's self-report of their grades, or you could go in and look at school records, or you could ask a teacher, is this student doing well, or is this student doing a work? Operational definitions, some of which, some of these can be variables. So student records is a variable. Some operational definitions are not variables. They might be conditions. So on the Harlow monkey example, the wire monkey mother versus the terry cloth mother monkey, those were assigned operational definitions of what we want to think of as a comforting or just a food supplying variable. Now these three things, constructs, operational definitions and variables, go from the most general parts of a theory and the most specific part. And as such, it's your job, this is research methods, to be a critic of a research program. Each of these three things can get criticized. So the way that the chapter lays this out, there are four different types of validities that we can use to criticize a theory. The construct validity, the statistical validity, the internal and the external validity. And later on in this slideshow, we'll talk about those four different terms. So our way of looking at this is, first of all, we need to talk about what these terms are. And second, the emphasis is, how can we criticize a research program at each of these levels? Constructs, conceptual variables. This is a statement in words about what you're researching. And I just mentioned, you know, if you go to page 59 of the book, they're talking about three different operational definitions of this general idea of school achievement. At the level of the construct or the conceptual variables, it's often the case that criticizing that construct is something you do outside the research program. So to go back to grades, you could say, are the physical products of classroom exercises, the grades on your tests, actually a measure of school achievement? Or should we be researching other achievements that happen in school? Like, can we be measuring how students what they remember later, or how are they going to do on standardized tests? 
Soar, you know, both of my kids uh, were in schools and had a lot of group projects. And those were, to some extent, easier or harder projects, depending on what kind of a group you got in. The existence of a construct itself may reflect a social construct, a cultural bias, or a false narrative. It's hard to refute this empirically because there's an entire network of assumptions about how one group of people want to talk about the phenomenon. So school achievement is one example. I was trying to think of an example of a construct that was really offensive and has generated a lot of harm. And it's not psychological, but there were psychological implications of it. It's called the construct of unilateral cultural evolution. Has anybody heard of this before? Or unilinear? It's okay to say no. No. No, okay. Well, I see I've got, okay. Oh, I've got no's in the chat. I'll keep the chat open. Okay. Well, it's this idea that comes to us originally from Scotland that every culture has to pass through four stages. In stage one, you've got hunter gatherers as in this rather romantic idea of a bunch of evidently Caucasian people hunting elk with the antlers on their heads. And after you are done with hunting and gathering, you then go into a pastoral or nomad model where you domesticate animals and you herd them from place to place. And then after you're done with that level, your culture then proceeds to agriculture. And finally, when you're done with agriculture, you go into the model of commerce. So if we're looking at the agriculture model, here we have, again, another sort of 1950s-ish idea of what an agrarian lifestyle was like. People are now living in homes and they're harvesting their food. And on the bottom, of course, we have this picture from the state Missouri capital of commerce, a whole bunch of commerce going on. And the idea was that your culture evolves no skippings allowed. And all other cultures that you see around you are simply natural experiments. They were stunted at earlier ages of development. So for example, in the 1700s, when Americans encountered Native Americans, they said, oh, these people are hunter gatherers. They are therefore less civilized. Their culture is removed from ours. Perhaps they are also like children because you know, the only reason that they would be hunter-gatherers is they're, they're less intelligent than we. And there's a lot of problems with that. But if you are talking to a person who is a believer in unilinear cultural evolution, it's really difficult to argue with that. Now, historically, it ignores the fact that people and civilizations mm. live the way they do in an area in response to the resources and challenges of their area. You know, so the, there's a reason that, for example, the Plains Indians lived the way the Plains Indians did. Or for example, the reason that the Inca empire existed the way it did. You know, that they did not have, for example, draft horses uh, and animals. They also did not have the wheel. And as we're understanding cultures better, we realize that Native Americans, for example, were excellent farmers. So, I mean, autobiographical note, and I mentioned the name of the law, even though I consider that, you know, the law has a slur in it. In Iowa, there was a law on the books called the half-breed law. And what that meant is that if you were a mixed ancestry in Iowa, you were 
entitled to a farm outside the reservation and you could elect to live off the reservation they give you a farm and hopefully that would help you get into what you know the dominant agricultural society is these native americans i mean were excellent farmers but they were not farmers in the sense of let's plow up a field and plant corn they were really good at gardening and they were really good at gardening a lot of little gardens, very small gardens, and they also used rocks. If you'd walk into these little gardens, you'd see a plant here and a rock next to it. And of course, to our way of thinking with farmers plowing the fields, having a rock in your garden makes no sense. It's gonna bust your plow. Well, those rocks are there to stabilize the temperature. So when a frost happens, your plants are more likely to survive because the rock is there. Uh, actually also using lots and lots of little gardens is kind of helpful because if deer, raccoons, and all the other animals you have around destroy one of your gardens, you still have another garden to fall back on. Or if you have insects ravage one of your crops, they're less, you know, it's given that it's broken up, they're less likely to travel. And also some societies appear to skip levels. So the story of Australia is you, know, you had these Aborigines and they were hunter gatherers and they did not go through this four stage level. But nonetheless, the idea of unilinear cultural evolution is a very important one in America. And you know, we all kind of know who Teddy Roosevelt is and the idea at that time was some cultures are more advanced than others and they're more fit. And it's only natural that they displace more primitive cultures. And there is this idea that specifically the Aryan race, the whites, that they follow the sun, that arising in the Caucasus, they then took over Germany, Northern Africa, and after that, England, and after that, the United States, they were always, always going to the West. And I included a little quote here. It might be hard to read in terms of the PowerPoint slide presentation, but the vast movement by which this continent was conquered and peopled can't be rightly understood if considered by itself. It was the crowning and greatest achievement of a series of mighty movements, and it must be taken in connection with them its true significance will be lost unless we grasp, however roughly, the race history of the nations who took part therein. And if you'd like, I put a, a link to Imperial Cruise on there. You can read that um, electronic version. It's a wonderful story of how this idea of Aryan nationalism shaped American policy. There was only one problem. As America then said, well, our, our next new point of conquest is to cross the Pacific and start conquering people there. Little detail there, America did not have a big Navy. And another little detail is the English, the French and the Germans were already in Asia and they had navies. So what did we do? Well, we turned to the Japanese and we said, you know, you Japanese people, you're you're not really Asian, you're, you're Aryan. And you have every right then to subjugate Korea. And you know, as we can see in the events as the 1800s turned into the 1900s, what implications that had for World War I and World War II. But, you know, this is another little quote I couldn't resist. Uh, that John Burgess is a professor who taught this. And you can take some time to read through that, but the idea is it's the mission of the white man to spread democracy. And since after all, Teutons invented the state, the organs of the state should be controlled only by people with Teutonic blood, you know, what dark others need apply. So at that time uh, of, Roosevelt and Taft, we had the Philippines. You know, the Philippines were under 
this idea, people of color, and therefore childlike and unfit for self-government. If you're at the level, to turn this back to research methods, if you're at the level of criticizing the construct, one place to start is to criticize the fundamental values on which that construct is based. So for example, values of human dignity, values of multiculturalism, values of getting along in the world in a humane and non-warlike fashion would certainly be things that you could criticize about this unilinear model. The other thing you can do is say, well, you know, that's one way of thinking about things, this unilinear model, but there are probably other ways to talk about cultures that you see around them that are more precise, that explain perhaps the data better, and that are more productive in terms of a research agenda. Well, so things that are productive, one that we've talked about so far is being falsifiable. It's very hard, even though you can observe some things in history, it's hard to design an experiment <clears throat> that will definitively prove to someone who's a believer that this unilinear model does not work. But you can say there are other more productive ways that perhaps explain the data better and explain human behavior that do not involve this simple four-step stage model. So operational definitions is that transition point where we go from our construct and then we go to our, self, our particular measures that we think are examples of what that construct is. As I said before, self-report, school records, and so forth. Have any of you had experiences with operational definitions of other things? For example, academic aptitude, critical thinking, or intelligence. Have you heard of any measures of these things? Like an IQ test? Yeah, that's interesting. And what's all in an IQ test? If you've ever looked at it. All I know is that I failed the spatial awareness section. <laughs> you know, I, you know, I have a little side the story lady, about that. The lady said, well, at least you don't want to be an engineer. <gasps> really? Yeah. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Obviously, I was scarred. I still remember it. <laughs> <laughs> but, all right, so visual spatial learning was one of them. Uh, and then if you've taken an IQ test, maybe they had you listen to a story about a woman from Boston who lost her purse. Tickle any memory? That's a, kind of the memory part in there. I remember they listed off numbers and I had to remember as many numbers in a row as possible. Digit and span. Mm -hmm. There was um, like a term definitions one, so she would like give me a term and then I'd have to define it. Mm -hmm. That's kind of, kind of a vocabulary thing. And then there's maybe just to kind of talk a little bit more, there's a there's something called the trails test, trails A and B, where they show you a piece of paper and there's letters and numbers and you're supposed to connect the dots of 1A, 2B, 3C, and so forth. And you know, what do you think of all those things as measures of intelligence? Well, they're easy to measure, they're easy to score. Um, I would say I don't know how and there are other kinds of intelligence out there, being able to read someone. Do any of you ever go hiking? Like in the Rockies? 
No. No? Yes. Yes? Okay. Occasionally. Do you ever have any scary experiences? No, or, I don't think so. No. How about some things that turned into a difficult experience? Actually, yes. Okay. I found one in my memory. <laughs> so we were in the Tetons, actually. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, tell us the story. Um, we went like ATV riding in the Tetons, and we got one of we had two ATVs, and we got one of them stuck in this. So it's this huge like mud puddle and it doesn't look like anything <gasps> until we got the atv in it and it was like four or five feet deep mm -hmm. it was like a little lake <laughs> oh no and so we had to try to pull this atv out by the end it was a whole ordeal yeah we well we couldn't we didn't have like a winch or or anything a winch or anything but it we had to like we like had to put like logs and stuff underneath the wheels and we had to like push it and we were the tires were like spinning so it was like splattering mud up into us as we were trying to push it out <laughs> we were so covered we were completely and utterly caked in mud and it was just it was bad and we <laughs> we finally got it out though <laughs> but that was that turned out to be we were like ah oh, yes this is fun and then it was not fun <laughs> so what a would a really seasoned, experienced person have avoided that situation? That, uh, I hope so. <laughs> I don't know. Well, if you've been out there, you know, if, if you're out there, and I guess my point is, if you lived out there in the mountains or you were a tour guide, you probably wouldn't have gotten the people in that situation. Yeah. But that was a kind of intelligence. I mean, that's sort of looking at the environment you have and saying, oh, I think I'd rather not. And I guess to me, the couple of times I've been you know, hiking in the Rockies and you're going from one place to another place way far away, as you think about all the little decisions you're going to have to make as you walk from one place to the other, you couldn't make like a standardized test and say, Oh, and here's your ATV, and how should you drive it around? What should you avoid? What should you avoid for? But there's so many judgments that need to be made to have that successful experience. But yeah, I think we'd all agree that there's some kind of intelligence going on there. Um, you know, I, and it's just not measured because we can't make tests of it, but we should probably be a little bit skeptical of intelligence tests as measuring how well one should re would respond in a given situation, I guess is my point. Academic aptitude, well, you've all taken academic aptitude tests. That's the, the ACT, the Iowa Tests of Basic Skills, the SAT. And those things have verbal and math. And for some odd reason, there's the belief that this will predict how you will be doing in school. So my master's degree was from the University of Iowa, home of the Iowa Tests of Basic Skills and the ACT and Westinghouse Learning and SRA Learning and all those other good places. And also very incestuously related with the Educational Testing Service in New Jersey. Basically, they share employees, they share contracts on the LSAT and GRE and so forth. And yes, I mean, those item banks are there. And yes, we have verbal ability and quant ability. But to tell you a few things about that, the ACT math is not a stable thing. You shouldn't really think that, oh, we should admit this person or not admit this person based on their math scores because math scores are something that represent a you know, concrete body of data. You know, there, there are ways, for example, to improve your visual spatial learning. 
Well, there, there are brain things that are involved in that, but you can improve it. And clearly in terms of things like algebra and geometry and so forth, <clears throat> there are also classes you can take and the research is pretty undisputed. You can raise your quantitative, your ACT math or your GRE quant score by taking classes. Um, but here's another little story. When I was in high school, uh, I really liked algebra and I was tutoring people, uh, fellow students about that. There were a number of women who I was helping with algebra and it was frustrating. And then comes eighth grade and I take geometry. And I was surprised that geometry was really hard for me. And the people I was tutoring soon were the people who were tutoring me. And I kept saying, how can you do this? I mean, this, is, this just makes no sense. And the response was, oh, geometry, finally something that makes sense to me. And I kind of have this pocket theory, you know, since I'm a psychologist and sitting in an armchair, here's an armchair theory, that the curriculum that schools have is adapted from an earlier age. And I suspect that to some extent, maybe men and women differ in whether they have, let's call it an algebra mind or a geometry mind. And if you look at the way that we teach people, it's designed to, you know, the college education, the high school education was designed for men. You get basic math, then you get algebra, then you get a sniff of geometry in the eighth grade, and then we come back to advanced algebra and calculus, all things that have that algebra component to it. Then you go to college, and you know, if you've taken calculus in college, all of a sudden they start saying, oh, and here's how to understand geometry from an algebra standpoint with integrals and so forth. And to be honest, that's where I finally understood geometry. And then only years later, if you have hung out and stayed with it that long, do you get back into geometry things like topology? So some of the biases that we have, some of our beliefs about academic aptitude, this is a criticism of the construct, may be confounded with the way we introduce our curriculum. Academic aptitude also varies by sex in terms of its relationship to grades. There are predominantly, you know, I joke around in my lab, you know, that the men are slime hypothesis, you know, they tend not to perform up to level that it's far easier to find a woman with high academic aptitude who does well in college than it is to find men who have high academic aptitude and do well in college because they tend to blow things off. They tend to be underregulated. So, you know, there's problems with any operational definition you have as to whether it actually reflects the, the construct that you have. Teacher evaluations being another thing, it should be kept in mind that the whole reason we got into this ACT, GRE, intelligence testing issue goes back to France and a professor by the name of Benet who said, well, actually it's very hard for us to judge which students are more or less able or which students need help because teachers cue, cue into physical characteristics of their students. If you are a well-dressed French student, teachers tend to think, oh, this person is a better student. And the intelligence tests, the aptitude tests were designed to try to equalize or actually help underprivileged populations in France. It's rather paradoxical that you, know, you hear an awful lot about how there is racial bias in these tests and that exists, but there's a question here as to whether that racial bias inheres in the instrument or whether we are documenting societal racial biases or whether the test is biased to the culture. It's a complicated issue. So, and this is kind of 
a way to be critical about an operational definition. If you ask somebody, what grades did you get? There's kind of a pressure on you to say, well, you know, mostly A's and B's. First of all, because it's a little embarrassing to say B's and C's or C's and D's, or if you are a C and D student, you're likely to say, I don't wanna answer that question. Secondly, checking records is difficult. You should not think that just because you're looking at records that this is true. So like I said before, one of the things I'm doing for the department is an evaluation of the correlations of you know, succeeding or at least not failing at Mizzou. Well, a lot of our records, yeah, the data are there, but you shouldn't believe them. Sometimes, for example, high school guidance counselors will, you know, you're asked, what's this person's rank in their class? And they don't know, they'll just say zero, or they'll say one, and you shouldn't believe that. Secondly, you know, we have to think a little bit about the various experiences that our students have. Some of our students are homeschooled. Yes, they graduated at the top of their class and they were the only person in the class. And as I mentioned before, teacher observations are themselves also prone to problems because students who act out, students who have a disability of some sort uh, are more likely to be flagged as less able and less you know, less intelligent. Um, I can tell you a story out of my life there. You know, as I said, you know, I didn't come from a very wealthy background. I didn't have glasses for until the eighth grade. And the word on the street in the classrooms was I was a very inattentive child who was easily distracted and had to sit at the front of the room. Well, that's true because I couldn't see the blackboard. And <laughs> If you can't see things, you tend to look at the things you can see around you. So you know, there, there are biases, possible problems, which each, with each of these observational definitions that are slightly different than the construct problem of, is this really school achievement? So you know, just as a way of thinking about this, is your operational definition really the construct? Is it accurately recorded? Is this reliably recorded? That is, if I did an assessment again, would I get the same numbers? Is it uncontaminated by other variables like SES, like attention, like physical disability? And are there other things can we, that we can doubt about it? Some operational definitions lead to variables. Now, the book has two ways of talking about these. They say they are observed variables or they are recorded variables. I'm sorry, all, I'm sorry, all variables have at least two levels and they are observed and they're recorded. And they can be manipulated or merely observed. A manipulated variable is a variable that you assign to people. I'm going to put you in the fun instructor who makes a lot of jokes class, or I'm going to put you in the instructor from Mars who just goes through the PowerPoint presentations. Merely observe variables are variables that I look at, but I do not have control over. So if I asked you how you felt about today, or if you're happy to be here, I can't control that. I'm merely observing it. <clears throat> variables can be nominal variables. That just means they have categories like colors, colors of a car, red, blue, green, or they can be ordered categories. So you've all taken questionnaires that say on a five point scale, rate how much you agree or disagree with this. It's not possible on a five point scale, if you're clicking a button to get anything other than one, two, three, four, five, but presumably two is more of something than one and three is more than two. Whether the jump from one to two is the same as the jump from two to three is an issue. And there are models that take into account the fact that the magnitude of that jump might be different depending on those categories. Other variables are continuous. What's your ACT score? How tall are you? 
Uh, how much do I weigh? And those numbers can, in theory, have you know any number of values. Like for example, what do I weigh now? 198.6. Trying to work on that during the time of COVID. Uh, and weight is a ratio variable. A ratio variable means there is a meaningful zero point. In theory, you could weigh something and it would weigh zero. Another variable is an interval variable that's continuous. So for example, ACT scores or your score on a depression inventory. A zero on that thing does not mean you have no verbal ability or you have absolutely no depression. As a matter of fact, being undepressed usually is some number like five or six or seven, but there are continuous values in your scale. So one way I tell my graduate students to think about this is if you're playing with a measuring stick, like a measuring tape, yeah, that has a meaningful zero point. And then in my own life, when my son was, oh, I think five or six years old, he had the measuring tape. And you know how it's fun for kids to pull on that measuring tape and press the button and watch the thing snap back in? Well, he kept playing with, I said, don't play with that, it's not a toy. Okay, dad, press the button, snap, snap. And then I heard from the next room, oh crap. And what happened was, you know, it was broken. So I now was a proud possessor of a measuring tape that starts at 17 inches. Well, at the beginning, my measuring tape was a ratio scale. Something could have zero length. But now I have a measuring tape that starts at 17 inches. Well, can I still use it to make decisions about who is taller than whom? Or can I use it to figure out if, say, a piece of furniture is going to fit through the doorway? Sure. It's just that I can't use my measuring tape to figure square footage in my room anymore because if I multiply length times width, I'm not gonna get any number that makes sense. So that's kind of a, a little mnemonic for remembering the difference between ratio and interval scales. So this is a table from the book and it walks us through some examples of variables and the levels of the variable and whether that variable is manipulated or observed. So just to kind of read through this a little bit, car ownerships, people ask them, do you own a car, do you not? There's two levels to that variable, you own a car, you don't, and it's measured. Now, if I were Oprah Winfrey, I could make that a manipulated variable. I'd say car ownership, today's audience gets a car. And tomorrow's audience doesn't. They get maybe a thing of perfume. Well, that would make car ownership manipulated. Uh, expressing gratitude to a romantic partner. And, you know, do you tell your partner often uh, that they're the best? And the levels of that variable can be seven, one through seven. That's going to be an interval scale or an ordered categorical scale, and it's measured. Could I assign people to a condition in an experiment, say, go home and tell your partner this is what's going on? Yes. Uh, type of story told about a scientist. They read stories about Einstein and Curie. There's two levels of this. Is the story about struggles or is the story about achievements? That's a manipulated variable. What time children eat dinner? Well, you know, that's something that comes up a lot in the literature. Having a daily food diary, you write down what happens and you can divide the kids into two groups. That's a measured version of it. You could easily manipulate it though. If you can say, if you're willing to be in this study, will you okay. wait to feed your kids until later? I think we're getting close to where we wanna be, but there are three claims about research, frequency claims, association claims, and causal claims. And not all of these are based on research. 
that sometimes you'll see these claims just appear that everyone knows. A frequency claim, you know, so what we want you to be able to do is to distinguish between these three different types of claims. And a frequency claim is kind of the easiest one to look at because that's going to involve one variable and we're going to be looking at prevalence. So 42% of Europeans don't exercise, middle school kids see two to four alcohol eyes a day. That's just how often does this happen? Association claims are relating one variable to another. Angry Twitter communities are linked to heart deaths. Girls are more likely to be compulsive texters. Suffering a concussion might triple the rate of suicide. And causal claims are music lessons will increase your IQ, family meals, curb eating disorders, those types of things that you're trying to say directly, this variable makes that variable happen. <clears throat> causal claims are a little tricky. And if I were to offer you know, some comments about the causal claims that are made in the book, you know, it's a little bit difficult. So here's my little slide to say, you know, if you're looking at a frequency claim, you're only going to look at one variable. And that variable is usually measured one time. Sometimes you will see a frequency claim that might span more than one variable. So for example, in research that I do at Mizzou, we might ask, how many drinks do you drink on Friday night? We might also ask, how many times do you drink five or more drinks in a sitting? And how many times do you drink 20 or more drinks in a sitting? And we look at all three of those frequencies. But you know, generally speaking, we're not trying to relate one variable to another. An association claim is that there's one level of a variable and it's associated with another one. And you've got at least two measured variables there. You can say that those variables are correlated or that they co-vary. Uh, there's a small you know, issue in the book. Sometimes she talks about two variables having a covariance and that covariance is a mathematical term like a mean or a standard deviation. So saying that they co-vary is maybe a little more precise. So let's bring it to Mizzou. Here's a frequency example done by yours truly. How many drinks do you drink in the past week? And this was done by semesters of students at Mizzou. It was longitudinal data. And on the top, you'll see the men. And on the bottom, you'll see the women. So on average, across the semesters, the men are drinking four drinks a night on Friday. And the women are consuming far, far less. They're drinking on average two. And this, the number one in each of those little bar charts is the fall semester of the freshman year. Two is the spring. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight are the successive semesters. So we'll see at five, there's a bit of a jump because a lot of people become legal at that point for the men. But this is a simple frequency association. It includes, by the way, individuals who abstain. So there are people at Mizzou who, for religious reasons or other reasons, do not drink at all. But the, the thing you're looking at here are averages. So to me, that's rather startling. Five drinks or more in a sitting on average is what gets associated with cognitive deficit. And, you know, I was a college student once, way back when the Earth's outer crust was cooling. Yes, and at that point, drinking was legal at 18. But, and, and a lot of people at Mizzou do drink and they mature out of it later. But there is a proportion of individuals who do not mature out of it and who are consuming alcohol in really bad quantities. So there are some people at Mizzou, for example, who report spitting up blood in the morning. And that's usually a symptom that's associated with skid row drunks. It means that you're consuming so much alcohol that you are scarring the esophagus and it's bleeding at night. So it's 
although the cultural idea is that drinking is okay and it's just something a lot of people do in college and it's part of the great unexamined life, it is a serious health problem. And you know that doesn't count into other things that make alcohol consumption a problem, such as engaging in regrettable sex or drinking and driving or being involved in physical altercations or accidents. You know, walking while drunk is a, a big hazard as well. We're talking about, you know, the book goes on to talk about scatter plots. Now, happily, I know all of you, or if you did not, you took a class that's equivalent. You've had Jessica Utz's book, Seeing Through Statistics in Stat 1200 or 1300. Yes. And oh, I see a comment here. Yeah, you're right, 70s and 80s in some states it was. <laughs> oh yeah, uh, it, and it, the, the reason that that came in at 18 was uh, there was suffrage. They were starting to let 18 year olds to vote and it was a big problem. I mean, there were a lot of drinking and driving happened which is what caused it to be changed. As a matter of fact, you know, if you might recall that the Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg recently passed away. One of her first legal challenges was in Texas. And the problem there, and I'll, I'll shut up because I know that I'm getting close to the end of the time. The problem there is the law in Texas at that time was that men who were 18 year olds could not buy alcohol, but women could. So the net result was, of course, the men would give money to the women and the women would go into the store and buy the alcohol. And one of her first sex discrimination cases was saying, you know, there's no reason why you should not be giving equal rights to men as to women, thereby establishing a legal precedent of sex discrimination. And it was on the shoulders of rulings like that, that she then went on to promote the radical ideas that women should be allowed to have credit cards in their own name. Women should be able to buy a house uh, women should be able to not necessarily change their name when they get married, those types of things. Well, I see that I am at time here. We'll put a pin in it. Uh, and we'll pick this up on Wednesday. I have office hours now.